Welcome, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, this is a uh, webinar uh, breakfast meeting on uh, the far uh, right and the pandemic. And um, I am uh, Hilma Mielda. Uh, I am a senior researcher uh, with the Norwegian Research Center. I do some research on the far right, but I am today uh, joined by two people who I consider to be internationally leading scholars on the far right. Um, I am joined on my left by Lars Erik Bansen. He's a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Department of Comparative Politics in Bergen. University of Bergen and affiliated with um, the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo. Lars Erik works on political violence, far right activism, and effective polarization in Western Europe. Uh, Katrina is also with the Center. She's a researcher, Dr. Dr. Katrina. Tollefsen, a researcher with the Center for Research on Extremism uh, at the University of Oslo. Um, she has a PhD in anthropology and political science, and her research interests are the anthropological uh, study of the far right, radicalization, nationalism, migration, and racism. So um, before I get to you, Lars Erik, first, uh, I would just like to say a few words about um, the far right and the politicization of uh, public health, because it is not a new phenomenon. It actually traces back to um, Nazi Germany's uh, ideas about genetic fitness, racial hygiene, and the ensuing racial uh, pur pur uh, purification programs uh, to cleanse society of defective elements so-called defective elements, such as the disabled, the mentally ill, homosexuals, and degenerate races. So uh, degenerate races were uh, also targeted for extermination uh, with the Nazi eugenics uh, program being uh, uh, the prelude to uh, the genocide of the Jews, Roma, Sinti, who were uh, dehumanized as toxins in the bloodstream of the body politic. So um, the trope of the immigrant as a public health risk has remained pervasive in anti-immigration discourse. I remember, uh, for example, the Swedish far right party, New Democracy, arguing that they were against immigration in part because immigrants would bring AIDS into Sweden. So uh, just a little bit of um, historical context there. Uh, Lars Erik. Uh, let me just see here. Get my zoom up here. Uh, let's do some level setting first. Uh, would you explain to us um, what do we mean by the concepts the radical right, uh, the extreme right? Uh, in what ways uh, are they similar? What are the differences? Well, uh, sure. You know, um, the topic of um, of uh, this uh, talk was. Uh, um, or use the term the extreme right. Uh, so uh, already here, from my point of view, I think uh, we can uh, start by deviating <laughs> from that. Um, and uh, we can start with the term far right. Uh, the term far right is used as a umbrella term, as a kind of a, a catch all uh, for the, both the extreme and the radical right that we see uh, today. And uh, when we talk about the far right, both the extreme and the radical right, what unites them is uh, this um, nativist uh, sentiment, this notion that the people and the state should be one and that foreigners, outsiders are an existential threat to that unity. And then you've got uh, distinctions uh, beneath that with the radical right uh, or the term radical right that we use uh, uh, is for those um, uh, far-right initiatives that do not oppose democracy per se and do not favor 
uh, the use of uh, violence to achieve their goals, um, but are more of a challenge to procedural and liberal democracy. Uh, a threat, you could say, the, uh, that could lead to the gradual erosion of uh, democracy as we know it today. Uh, in contrast with the extreme right, uh, which we know from the history of uh, fascism and Nazism and so on, uh, then we're talking about a revolutionary phenomenon that extols violence, as violence is not only it's not only necessary, but also a good thing, um, and advocate for the complete overthrow of democracy. So within this umbrella, of course, we have some very clear divides when it comes to uh, certain uh, elements that uh, when, come into, when they come into play in, uh, in politics and in real life do mat matter tremendously. And then ben beneath that, we've got several kind of uh, subdivisions. You can talk about, as I mentioned, the Nazis, ethno-nationalism, anti-Islam, what have you. Um, but the core thing is, is nativism, right? And so I just wanted to bring that back to the, you, you had that kind of a, the health angle um, immediately there. Um, so I want to say that uh, uh, you're not far right simply because you are a so-called coronavirus denier or opposed to lockdowns. That is not in and, in and of itself a criteria or sufficient to be called far right. So, uh, but that is uh, an element that we now see that some advocate, uh, but it's not sufficient. Hmm. Um. First, uh, I, I, I forgot to say that uh, the people out there watching across the world, um, please feel free to submit questions and we'll get to a Q&A session uh, towards the end of this, uh, this uh, webinar at around 8, 15, uh, 9.15 or so. We should get uh, to the question part. So you can uh, just um, uh, send a question and it'll pop up on my screen. Um, Katrina, um, could you say something about the, the far right landscape in Norway to begin with, uh, as it looks today, as it exists today? Uh, who, who are the groups, the actors that we're talking about here? Um, there are numer numerous groups, but in Norway, it's mostly manifested in the organized anti immigration and anti. Um, Islamic movements such as Pegida stopped the no Siam stopped the Islamification of Norway. We also have the more classic Nazi movement and organizations such as, as the Nordic Resistance Movement. That's a pan Scandinavian movement of Nazi activists. And if you count those with Norwegian citizenship, we are talking about actually only a few um, tens of um, activists. But of course, there's also more actors beyond these organizations. We have increasingly also activists in digital subcultures that are also networking, for instance, at Chan forums or encrypted services such as Telegram with activists across the globe. So although you're an activist that is demonizing minorities and migrants and holding them responsible for anti-lockdown measures or or um, existential threats to the nation, you do not necessarily write in Norwegian, you write in English and you engage with um, globalized networks in cyberspace. Um, I forgot to mention also that there is an actor in Norway that's a micro party called the Alliance, which is an anti-Semitic political mm -hmm. party. Um, but in contrast to, for instance, in Denmark, where, where you also have a Islamophobic mini party or very small party, it has not obtained uh, significant uh, support or votes. Did I forget anyone, uh, Lars Erik? Oh, uh, well, I mean, uh, there are uh, others we can mention, but those are the, the main ones. So yeah, good job. <laughs> um, but my, I guess the key point here is that instead of focusing on a single party of movement in a particular nation mm -hmm. state, what the pandemic has made evident is how viral conspiratorial ideas of threatening difference spread across continents. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Lothar, like you want to jump on that? No, no. Uh, well, um, what I can say is um, uh, that uh, absolutely, I think that um, the recent developments, not only with um, the coronavirus situation, but 
developments in general over the last decade, I think, have really brought home uh, the fact that what we're speaking of now is a very much a transnational phenomenon. So you have these kind of local and sometimes national uh, bases or anchors, you could say, right? So people still uh, uh, talk within the confines of national politics, but it's very much a transnational um, and indeed a global phenomenon that we're talking about uh, with the, the far right today. And um, that has a tremendous impact also um, in the present situation with um, the um, coronavirus and uh, the various uh, conspiracy theories and sub kind of uh, new varieties of uh, different conspiracies uh, that we see uh, that uh, sort of uh, diffuse through uh, the system. Some start, for instance, in the United States, some start in Southeast Asia, uh, but um, within a very short time period, you have uh, kind of um, this uh, exposure to these uh, uh, conspiracy theories more or less across the globe. And you see that uh, some far right actors, uh, not all, but some are very uh, strong proponents of some of these conspiracy theories. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're getting into uh, um, um, the far right's reaction to, the, to, to, the, to this particular health crisis. And um, uh, I've done some, some research on it, and it, it seems as uh, or, or the, the, the far right, it, their reaction, uh, their reaction uh, reflects uh, their ideological priors. So we get the authoritarianism, the populism, the nativism. Um, could you could you follow up on that, uh, uh, Katrina? Uh, how, how would you broadly describe um, the far right's? reaction or the rhetoric or even their mobilization as a reg as a regard as relates to this particular uh, pandemic changes any, any changes well yes in terms of the actors i've been studying which are pred predominantly uh, far right milieus in digital subcultures for instance at the plan platforms you do see a recycling of old fascist tropes and grammars of exclusion and those tropes are then reconfigured in response to them COVID-19 crisis, so, so you will have, for instance, um, anti-Semitic tropes that George Soros or Bill Gates are using, are actually spreading responsible for, for the pandemic and inventing vaccine to obtain world domination and control, or you will have racialized um, stereotypes of Asians that it's actually a, the China virus, that this is being used as a biological weapon by China to obtain world dominance and control. So it's um, ascribing both nationality to the virus itself and also uh, politicizing different minority groups. So, but the key point in terms of uh, changing enemy images is that it's very much old hatreds and kind of new wrappings, but due to mm. these technologies, you see also intersecting forms of hatred. So you will have that the um, Jew is responsible for using migrants of Muslim background as a biological weapon to destruct um, and destroy uh, the white West. So this is uh, integral to, to white supremacy ideology, for instance. Mm. Yeah, yeah. If I can uh, interject. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, reflect on this, um, uh, the broader scene. So here you've got uh, kind of one, one um, component of the far right today that Katrina talked about. Uh, um, uh, which is more important today than it has been before, you could say, uh, for, the, for a couple of decades um, <clears throat> uh, due to their kind of their impact uh, online. But um, in general, I think we can see two different patterns. And the one on the one hand, you have what uh, Katrina mentioned now that you have this kind of re uh, interpretation of old ideas, old um, conspiracies, tropes about uh, uh, Jews, about Soros and so on. And then, um, so as a kind of a strategic opportunity in that sense. And then uh, on the other hand, um, the predominant response I would say by more radical rights actors um, is one of uh, direct opposition to lockdown measures and, and questioning the, the impact of the coronavirus itself, sort of uh, trivializing it, uh, uh, right? So those are, 
I mean, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, but uh, uh, on the ground, what we've seen now is that uh, these are the more or less two main directions that the far right has taken this. And of course, it also reflects more general uh, patterns in, in society where uh, on the one hand, you have these more explicit uh, direct conspiratorial perspectives um, in subcultures uh, that also go beyond the far right. And then in uh, broader uh, society, of course, you've, got, you've had um, over time uh, quite substantial mobilization against, uh, in some countries at least, uh, several of these uh, coronavirus uh, measures, measures to tamp down um, the, the disease. Hmm. Um, let's let's stay with the the, the, the lockdown um, or the point you made about lockdowns, because um, uh, from from what I I'm able to to, to tell, it, and whether or not right, the far right opposes uh, lockdowns, it, it depends upon whether or not their, if you will, political allies. In the system are in power or in opposition. No, is, 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 that, is, is that correct, Katrina? Yes, at least in Western Europe, you've seen radical rights parties in a position such as Freedom for Democracy in the Netherlands that present themselves as freedom fighters against the tyranny of the establishment. Whereas in other countries where the far right is actually in power, such as uh, Hungary and up until recently the US, you will say, see a more uh, also actually support for lockdown measures, but they are also politicizing these messages to for further consolidation of power and power grabs, such as in the case of, of uh, Hungary, where mm. Viktor Orban used the pandemic crisis as a way to, to grab on more power, basically. Um, but in Western Europe, you will see that radical right parties, now we're talking about that those actors that are not openly endorsing violence, so radical right parties, they have actually failed to grow you know, during the pandemic due to this rally around the flag effect. So you will see that voters, they do, are drawn to kind of established political figures in times of, of crisis. And, and, and even Gert Wilders now, he failed to grow, whereas actually uh, Thierry Baudet that was propagating conspiracy theories and was openly anti-COVID lockdown measures. He, he obtained a few more seats based on that very um, uh, niche platform. Yeah. Mm. And uh, just a quick follow up on the United States. Um, in the United States, obviously, uh, anti statism is just such a huge part of the political culture. So it, it's actually it's kind of hard to tell if we're really, if we're dealing with, with just kind of generic anti statism or uh, more or the, the far right version of it. It's, 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 it. I don't know if you can separate the two, but it, uh, at least in theory, I think you can. Los Eric? Yeah, um, I think you're onto something here. And this is kind of a, uh, uh, like, can you tell if, if uh, this um, uh, coronavirus uh, crisis uh, is uh, in a respect, um, fundamentally, you could say changing the landscape uh, and, and in particular on the far right, is it changing it or not, right? And certainly I think we can say that, well, we're living in um, unsettled times, things are in flux. Uh, and from a, at least from a Western European point of view, we're experience, experiencing now uh, two decades of uh, more or less successive uh, you know, crises, which um, all have the potential to cause political realignment. Um, and then now the Corona crisis kind of uh, in a real life uh, terms and impact terms of impact, it's the largest crisis. Um, but uh, <clears throat> for the far right, I think we can draw uh, or shed light on this by drawing parallels to 9-11 to and the political transformations that happened after that. And um, then you had in the aftermath there, you had uh, the birth of a kind of a, a new far right movement, right? Focusing on Islam and on Muslims and a major transformation also of the uh, already existing uh, radical right and some extreme right communities. So is that going on here? And I would say uh, that <clears throat> uh, 
it does not look to be of a similar magnitude. So what we're going through now hasn't uh, led to the kind of the creation, the genesis, if you want, uh, of a new addition to the far right. But it has more in common than with um, other uh, more recent crises, like the economic crisis from 2008 and onwards, in that it uh, shakes things up, um, um, creates possibilities for new coalitions, um, um, and it's something of what you can describe as a kind of a discursive opportunity, if you want, or a kind of a mm. rhetorical opportunity. But it's not a so far, it's early. It's a bit early to say, kind of decisively. Of course, I shouldn't, <laughs> but uh, but it doesn't seem to be a game changer in that sense. Um, but uh, one one thing uh, I noticed though is that the far right uh, in Norway, th those that I've looked at, they do believe this is a, a game changer in the sense that they're celebrating the implosion of the liberal world order. This is the end of globalism. This is the, we're witnessing the rebirth uh, of the nation states. Um, this is the new era of nationalism. Uh, even though, I mean, I think, you know, in the United States, this, with, with Trump in power, that was like their, their primary, their, their, like their best opportunity to prove the success, the greatness of the nation state, and they blew it. Uh, because Trump didn't know what he was doing. Uh, but, but Catherine, could, could you say something about that? Uh, what, what are the far right, what, what, are, what are far right actors international is saying about the liberal order and globalism and you know, uh, shutting borders? Because um, in Norway, you know, they're, they're celebrating prematurely. Well, I would say um, going back to nativism, which is a core feature of the far right, is that they do uh, celebrate um, bringing back borders and protecting the biosocial purity of this nation state imagined as quite pure. So it's, we're talking about a radical exclusionary uh, form of uh, nationalism. And that obviously ties these actors together. And also, as Lush Eric said, the drawing on your point is it's about the role of crisis. And it's not just you have a globalized health crisis, it also works in tandem with other crises of globalization, such as economy, culture, and politics. So even now, you can see an economic fallout of the pandemic that might be also politicized by all these actors to present themselves as you know, the authentic voice of the deprived little people. So both the public health I mentioned, but more importantly, the economic fallout will also be politicized to reinforce these national boundaries and to also reinforce this authoritarian contempt for liberal elites and, and globalists. And speaking of contempt for the globalists, because that goes back to also the anti-Semitism, which is embodied in the figure of, of George Soros that has almost turned into a code, coded language for, for mm. anti-Semitism. Um, Lars Eric, I wanna, I wanna uh, follow up on something you said. Uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, you were kind of suggesting that they're, they've kind of run out of people to, um, or, or groups to, uh, to go after, if you will. Um, but uh, uh, at least um, in, in, my, in my own research, uh, China China appears to be this new kind of boogeyman, this, this, this new enemy, at least on the Trump-friendly far right. Have you, have, have you noticed, uh, or are, are they saying anything new about China? Could China be like a new, with China rising globally? just in international politics, could China become a new major uh, well, actor and in, in, or, or, or actor to go after in their um, narrative? Well, I think, uh, sure, and, and it fits uh, with some, uh, you know, very old classical tropes within more of the fascist tradition <clears throat> of the, uh, they use the, the term, I mean, I mean, it was also widespread in society at that time. Uh, going back to the 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, even the 50s, when you know, with the terms of the yellow peril and you know the, the notion of being swamped by the by by the East, um, <clears throat> and also in demographic terms. But uh, uh, today, what you have is a kind of um, uh, a dilemma in a sense that, uh, at least for some of these actors, is that 
Well, the main since the main focus for a lot of them has been on Muslims and Islam and immigration. Uh, uh, China, in, uh, up until present day, has been seen by some as a kind of a, a positive force in that sense, right? That the, that the, they are cracking down uh, and, uh, on on Muslims and on um, uh, Islam. Uh, and seen as this kind of ally, and uh, some have been rallying around and kind of cheering on what uh, some today describe as a ongoing genocide of the uh, Muslim um, Uyghur uh, minority in, in the Western China. Um, so, um, so there were, so there are kind of these tensions uh, within the far right on that particular issue mm. in terms of geopolitics. Yeah, sure, I would say absolutely, and of course, if you have uh, far right actors, um, parties that come to power, then uh, that would be, I think, uh, the primary lens of the kind of opposition to China and viewing uh, and China as the enemy of what's but yeah. Mm. And uh, I want to get um, uh, get into um, the, or we should talk more about uh, the actual uh, re recruitment processes, the significance of the internet, um, uh, and um, yeah, all of that. But first, uh, one more kind of ideational point, uh, Catherine. Um, could could you say something about uh, the um, popularization of conspiracy theories? Uh, because uh, not now we have, at least in the United States, we have conspiracy uh, theorists being elected into Congress. And uh, in Norway, I, the most ridiculous conspiracy theory I saw was that. Uh, this so-called cabin uh, ban that we had last year, where, where in, uh, for a brief period of time, you could you couldn't go to your country house, your your, your cabin in the countryside. The far uh, someone, or one particular actor on the far right, was spec speculating that this was actually a secret plan uh, in order to prepare housing for refugees. J just just really far right stuff. Uh, could you say something about conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories and perhaps in particular uh, the QAnon, which is in Norway now too? Yes, uh, conspiracy theories are also, as we know, historically used in times of perceived crisis. So actors exploit the uncertainty associated with, with crisis to propagate not just anti-scientific enemy images, but also inherently dehumanizing enemy images. And what we saw with the QAnon is just another example of its very fast viral spread and that you have a global co-production and co-authoring of conspiracy theories. So you see how in the digital age, these new and emerging technologies are used to, yes, you, you, you reconfigure enemy, enemy images online, and then you also obtain a sense of oxygen and legitimacy from political developments that are occurring also in the wider uh, society and globally. And, and QAnon, as we know, also emerged from one of the boards at 4chan. So we see in particular how the Chan culture uh, has been integral in authoring internet culture that have in turn led to violent escalations. So um, the logic of, of QAnon to, to have this cleansing storm that would cleanse away the corrupt establishments and the liberal elite also echoes of the kind of white supremacist logic of um, accelerating the, the race war in real life to obtain purity. And in that ideology, you will also see how an anti-Asian racism enters. So I would say what we're looking at is a kind of form of cyber fascism. So in contrast to kind of classical fascism that also had lots of eclectic aesthetics, you will see how the internet fascism um, has also the same eclectic aesthetics. So you have intersectional forms of racism, but it has more connectivity and it's even spread even faster and it's even more decentralized, so less organized. So you will have all these kind of mini authors that take on the mission of being mm -hmm. digital soldiers. Um, yeah, so, and it has of course destabilizing effects for, for liberal democracies. Uh, uh, the, the specific, I just wanted to follow up on that was that, uh, you know, one of the specific incidents uh, where that has had a kind of real life in, uh, ramifications directly was uh, in, in uh, Germany when you had uh, demonstrators, protesters, um, uh, many of them far right, uh, uh, storm the steps uh, of uh, of uh, German Parliament, 
uh, right? And um, and um, uh, some of the, that was driven and motivated by this notion uh, uh, by, uh, of uh, QAnon uh, um, activists uh, um, that, uh, in fact, Trump was um, coming to Berlin <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. to support them, right? Uh, and to kind of uh, show the way and kind of uh, remake uh, uh, the West, right? Um, so, so they bought into that wholesale and that gave them the impetus, some of them at least, to, you know, uh, uh, take to action. Um, of course, it, it, it stopped there. It didn't go as far as uh, uh, what you had uh, with the U.S. Congress. Um, but you see that uh, these... Uh, um, evolving uh, conspiracy theories and uh, uh, when you have this kind of ongoing creation of these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tropes, um, uh, it can ha it can have uh, very direct uh, ramifications and quite immediate uh, uh, effects uh, that some would, uh, uh, that is difficult to guard against, I could say, right? Who in who in Germany would uh, a couple of months earlier have, have thought that that would happen and that would it would be inspired by by the Q and American Q and on uh, forever mm. against uh, around Trump, right? So yeah, 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 and, and I've seen uh, Catherine. You mentioned uh, Allianzen. Um, if you if you look at their Facebook uh, pictures, you can see all of them featuring uh, wearing Q and on uh, t shirts at this kind of uh, gathering. And the thing with conspiracy theorists, uh, theory, uh, theories uh, is that, uh, you know, you begin with the conclusion, then you uh, re-engineer the story and, and, uh, to, make, uh, to make it fit the narrative. You cherry pick facts to make uh, uh, facts uh, fit the narrative. Uh, so um, is this gonna be a big, big is this just gonna poison the public discourse? Is this, I mean, is this going to spread to it, it's largely been or at least in terms of mainstream discourse it seems to have been at least to me a largely largely a u.s phenomenon but is this going to become a factor in in our national politics too conspiracy theories um i think it is a factor already we might see the intensification of it because what we're looking at is and um, what is potentially destabilizing for democracies is that you have these and now, in a way, shadow publics enabled by uh, digital culture, where you have the viral spread of the uh, conspiracy theories. And there's been also anti COVID 19 uh, lockdown pro protests in Norway, where you, where you see that these mm. QAnon, Norwegian QAnon supporters are coming together with a bunch of different actors who might not, some of them might be more ideological, and some of them are just protesting. Um, lockdown measures so they have no kind of ideological reasoning behind it but yes i think it's already you're seeing how um this um contempt for liberal democratic institution contempt for science and contempt for mainstream media and liberal elites that's um a theme that resonates um in numerous different uh, national contexts um, and i think just to follow up on what you said about the role of nationalism, I think also what is new in a way is that it's not just focused on the nation state. Lots of these actors, yes, they might be concerned about protecting borders, but it's also looking at the civilizational space. So it's actually incorporating the imagined um, white west or the imagined um, civilization that needs protection. And I think that's also directly informed by the technologies activists use these days. Um, Los Eric, you, did you want to say something today? Uh, no, well, um, uh, it, it sort of goes back to my point of okay, so is this in a kind of uh, is this a uh, what we're seeing a fundamental transformation of the far right or not? Um, and that's of course not the only issue, <laughs> uh, but it's one. And uh, I would say, and I said tentatively, no, that it. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on that in light of what Katrina said is, and uh, uh, what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, so I would describe that primarily as people coming together now in this time of uh, kind of uh, where things are in flux and people are united by what they are against, not what they support, all these mm, people. Mm. 
So this is a classical ingredient for social movement coalition building, which of course might in turn uh, over time have, have uh, ramifications uh, directly, for instance, in party politics and so on, if it becomes more institutionalized and if you have actual organizations that, that take up some of these uh, messages, which of course you have in the United States but, uh, and in some Western European countries, but I would say not so much in in uh, in uh, Norway, for instance. Oh, okay. There is a large degree of variation on 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 that um, particular issue of institutionalization. I would say. Um, and uh, um, we we were emailing uh, or the other day, and. Um, we were, t were discussing um, new po the possibility of new alliances, you know, in, in, again, in the States now, I go back to that because I know that case best. In terms of uh, the vaccination program, the problem is no uh, longer su supply, it's demand. Uh, it's gonna be really hard to, to vaccinate people uh, who don't wanna be vaccinated. So, so Catherine, have, have you seen any kind of, um, short-term alliance between just like the broader anti-vaccination crowd, if you will, and, and the far right? Yeah, that's a trend we've seen also in Europe, in countries such as the United Kingdom, in Netherlands, and also now more recently in Norway during the pro protest in front of the parliaments in, in March. So you see this coalition between the anti-vaccination movement and how also far-right actors are trying to exploit that to propagate their own messaging. And that could be a message of um, violent revolution or, could, or it could be a message of just a contempt for uh, elites coupled with nativism. Um, the most profile case recently is how the leader for Forum for Democracy in the Netherlands presented himself as a freedom fighter against the lockdown measures and and mobilized in, in during the election. So the election campaign was completely dominated by the, by the pandemic. But again, the, the election result was primarily indicating how voters uh, rally around Mark Rutte, the established kind of uh, leader and, and uh, known political uh, figure. Um, so yeah, Lars Erik, you have- uh, Yeah, <laughs> continuously jumping in here. Uh, no, no. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I just thought of uh, other kind of uh, specific um, cases. Um, uh, there are quite a few. Um, of course, uh, in Germany, uh, you had this gradual change where Pegida and uh, the alternative for, uh, for Germany are there. Um, initially, they maintain a distance uh, towards uh, the um, uh, Corona uh, deniers and uh, vaccine oppositionists and so on. But uh, that has um, that has changed over the last couple of months, uh, and now they're picking up in uh, that the message of uh, you know uh, fundamental opposition to that, and also to to um, uh, what they call a kind of a, the to new totalitarian society, right? That Angela Merkel has sort of uh, created, and you see similar tendencies uh, in other countries, and and but they but they do uh, stick to their old talking points predominantly. So this is kind of a, uh, an addition. Um, and I think uh, as uh, Katina said, for, for, uh, for uh, many of them, it's a kind of a strategic opportunity. Of course, if you have a lot of people that fundamentally believe these things enter the organization, things will change. But, uh, but I thought of, uh, so one kind of a peculiar, not peculiar case, but one uh, case was in the Netherlands as well with the, the Dutch uh, variety of uh, Pegida, when a couple of months ago you had uh, riots break out. And Pegida was one of the organizations that uh, uh, initiated the, these uh, demonstrations. And they said, um, in, the, in the kind of call for, for people to rally online, they said, well, we're going to protest against lockdown. We're going to protest against uh, 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 the fake uh, coronavirus and so on, and how the state uses that. But we're also going to burn the Quran. So come, come and show, come and see that. We're going to burn the Quran, and that's what they've been doing. Uh, a lot of these organizations, um, particularly these anti-Islamic organizations, is that uh, they add the 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 Corona uh, virus uh, kind of um, path, <laughs> you know. But they mm. stick to their, but they stick to their main point of uh, of uh, Islam and Muslims being the main no. danger. Um, yeah. 
Um, so we're coming up in the hour. Uh, I want to um, um, do two more or, or ask you two more questions. Uh, first, uh, and this goes to you, Lars Eric. Uh, you've looked at um, uh, the counter mobilization and the the the, um, the various I don't know left, far left, Antifa, whatever label they they choose, or at least you've kind of um, thought about it because we're, 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 you know, discussed it. Uh, so could you say a, a, few, a few things about uh, uh, the counter mobilization? Are we well, talking about a illiberal response from the far left or who are we talking about here? Well, uh, what I can say is that so quite consistently on the streets, at least, uh, the far right, uh, both the extreme and the more kind of uh, radical right anti-Islamic groups, have been swamped, overwhelmed numerically by counter protesters. And it's a very broad uh, phenomenon. Uh, but you have uh, the kind of uh, yeah, more uh, militant uh, left, uh, some would say extreme uh, left wing extremists, right, from uh, Antifa and uh, similar kind of anti fascist um, communities. Um, um, but during the the present day situation, what we're seeing um, is uh, has been because of the the, the ongoing situation that uh, that uh, uh, smaller crowds have been uh, uh, showing up again to to uh, demonstrate against in general the 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 far right. Um, uh, uh, but it's also in some cases taken more of a violent turn. So you have had uh, uh, people attacking uh, the far right. So in Norway, of course, there are some prominent um, examples with the uh, stop Islamization of Norway being attacked and their leaders being um, beaten to the ground and so on, which has gained a lot of media attention, uh, generated a lot of debate. Uh, and um, yeah, I've looked into that particular issue. So it's not directly related to the coronavirus situation per se. Mm. But uh, what yeah. uh, I found was that uh, uh, it generates a popular backlash. So okay. if, when, when uh, counter demonstrators uh, attacked uh, Stop Islamization of Norway, uh, uh, it made, uh, uh, and people were exposed to that, uh, pe uh, people became somewhat more uh, tolerant for the far right. So in that sense, it created a backlash. Uh, um, and that's, but that is a, a pattern that is somewhat detached from the coronavirus mm, situation yeah. per se, sure, sure. Uh, but it is something that is currently playing out. And, and just a quick follow-up, uh, are these examples being exported uh, and used internationally? Have you noticed anything on that? I mean, uh, like uh, to, to, to um, just to argue in a narrative that, you know, look at how the far left is responding to us. These, these, the, the video from Bergen, I was there when it happened. Um, I could easily see that kind of thing being exported or, or and just going around internet. internet. Have you seen anything on that? Well, um, um, maybe uh, Katrina wants to uh, enter into that. Well, uh... Uh, not in terms of how the CM protest was mediatized um, internationally, but I can say something about the politics of provocation and how these actors uh, politicized the, the pandemic to propagate their own messaging. But they're also very dependent on mainstream media, their main enemy. So they want mediatization to propagate their propaganda even further mm. uh, and get support. and. At the core of their messaging is obviously a victimhood, how they're being silenced and victimized by liberal mainstream elites. So it's, it goes back to also <clears throat> awareness that uh, the ethics, the ethical compass that media actors should have when you have also, like in the US, you had these uh, boogaloo activists that were really um, trying to exploit protests against police uh, violence and the police killing of George Floyd to further their own agenda. And they got lots of screen time and, and mediatized coverage that gave them global attention uh, that does not reflect the actual number of activists. So, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Um, you know, being a revolutionary uh, kind of uh, re requires a certain amount of victimhood thinking, I, I think. Um, but so um, 
uh, we only have one question so far from, from the audience. Um, so um, I, I want to take maybe two or three minutes just to ask, ask you both for some reflections on, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the horrible, uh, horrible events of, uh, of uh, July 22nd, 2011. So um, could you say um, just a, a few words? Uh, how do you think um, that even particular uh, incident, event, the terror attack, did, did that have long-term impacts on the far right? In, nor in Norway and internationally. Katrina, do you want to say, go first? Yeah, I mean, I have some colleagues that are contributing to a special issue on the long shadows of 22nd of uh, July. But in terms of my own research, I have um, seen, um, I have researched how um, the veneration of the 22nd of July terrorists and other terrorist in digital subcultures. And, Brenton Tarrant, the shooter um, behind the Christchurch atrocities, he claimed he was directly inspired by, by Breivik, although that was partly shitposting. But I'm looking at how those lone actors that are partly radicalized in digital subcultures, how they uh, create a sense of um, community and belonging by both venerating and also praising uh, acts of, of terrorist um, violence. So in that sense, uh, he is um, an inspiration for having have obtained a, a high kill score. Uh, and I think if you look at, um, in terms of, there's a new generation of, of far right activists online that look to him as an inspiration, but they have even more technologies uh, present. So Tarrant, as we mm -hmm. know, live streams the atrocities. And that means that it's also consumed and circulated by Activist globally. Los Elik, do you want to say something about that? Or? Um, well, um, um, I am one of those uh, individuals uh, writing on uh, this uh, topic right now, so I, <laughs> I could say a lot. Um, I think uh, maybe I can summarize quite briefly is that, well, so you had the, the, the terror attacks and uh, the terror attacks by Bayevik were, uh, were kind of uh, meant to spread his uh, manifesto, the, this document that he had uh, written up and uh, his ideology, right? Um, and um, the uh, effect, the, re uh, the response uh, in Western Europe, the immediate response was uh, encountered to his hopes and desires uh, one of uh, uh, very strong condemnation by the far right, both the extreme and the radical right in Western Europe immediately after the attacks. And uh, moreover, you could, the process, the main process that played out was that uh, um, uh, uh, far right leaders uh, actively went out uh, and uh, sort of denigrated uh, him as a, as a, a madman and an, uh, an imbecile and, and so on. Right, so distancing, uh, really strong distancing uh, measures, you could say, and this is all driven uh, to a certain extent by the fact that in in uh, uh, Western Europe and a lot of Western societies, uh, the taboo against violence and particular political violence is really really strong, and that's a long term uh, development, uh, which of course um, uh, can become unsettled and change. Um, but so, so that's a, an explanation to parts of that pattern and they're also the responses. But what we saw uh, was in contradiction or in, uh, in opposition was that Bayevik was uh, uh, hailed as a hero by the Russian far right. The, the uh, kind of a, a subculture that he did not intend to speak to, right? So he, his goal was to speak to the, to the far right primarily in, in Western Europe, but it spread and traveled very quickly, and he was. Uh, people walked around with icons and placards celebrating Bayevik, and still to this day, he's considered a, a, a hero among um, uh, extreme right communities in, in Russia. Uh, and then, so that's one pattern. So, no support in Western Europe and su support uh, elsewhere <clears throat> uh, immediately after. And then, but now, as time has gone on, uh, we see. Uh, that um, 
these online subcultures have embraced Vivek to, to a in growing ex extent. Uh, so that he's used in various ways, uh, kind of uh, this kind of gamification of violence and uh, things that uh, Katrina is uh, looking into uh, that, uh, but you have uh, on these uh, 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 subcultural communities, this embrace of him in various ways, you could say in an instrumental manner. Um, but um, there is uh, definitely a change and it has, has in that sense, a kind of subcultural impact. Uh, to this day. And then of course, there's this other thing that well, all the kind of ramifications and spillover. So in particular in Norwegian society, of course, there is a very, you could say, um, uh, intense uh, struggle uh, conflict between the radical right or populist radical right, the Progress Party and the Norwegian Labour Party, right? Uh, that continues to, to uh, shape Norwegian society. Uh, but uh, more internationally, you could say, yeah, it's this use, it's halfway instrumental use and glorification of Vivek uh, as based on the violence he committed, right? Um, maybe a super quick follow from Catherine. We have to do some, uh, take some questions from the audience too. Uh, on, on mute. You unmute that's the sentence of the year or yeah. this decade. Yes, just uh, one sentence that uh, I do think that we see how um, emerging technologies are also fundamentally altering the character, nature, and workings of fascism. So, not only is Breivik venerated, but you also see how fascism is expressed through transgressive play frames. So, it's referenced with mimetic irony and distance. So, it's this. Um, anything goes kind of logic, which means that you both radicalized in this kind of uh, play frame. Um, and with the case of Tarrant, who claimed to be inspired by, by Breivik, he was so-called shitposting both the propaganda, the manifesto and the violent act itself. So I would argue that you see um, digital subcultures also altering uh, the expressions of, of and workings of fascism. Yes. Uh, thank you. Both uh, very much. Uh, we'll do some, uh, at least a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, could you, uh, one of you, um, say something about how uh, the pandemic has affected those in power, uh, far right parties in power, like in Poland and Hungary? Obviously, we know in the States, I, I believe Trump would have been reelected re if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Um, can, can you say something about, perhaps, uh, Catherine, about the the far right in power in Poland and Hungary? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, no, I, I wrote a piece last year called Quarantining Hungarian Democracy because what was uh, evident in the Hungarian case was uh, that Viktor Orban, the increasingly authoritarian um, uh, prime minister was trying to capitalize on the pandemic to consolidate his own power. So he was also then moving power from, from uh, the parliament to his, uh, to his own hand, basically, um, without a sunset, um, uh, yeah. So he was, he was definitely um, exploiting the pandemic crisis to further his own uh, illiberal uh, ends. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I'm just gonna read a question because I, I believe we're, we've touched upon this to some extent, but I, I'm just gonna read it and see if uh, any, any of you wanna say something about it. So um, can you say something about the relation between extreme ideas and extreme actions slash violence during the pandemic? Are extreme right individuals motivated by the pandemic to take action? So I don't know if, we, if you have anything to add beyond what we've said, kind of tangent, tangent to, I, I butchered that word, <laughs> Just, yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question, the correlation between thought and action correlation between propaganda and violent harm in the real world. Uh, I think the numerous examples now how some activists have crossed the Rubicon from thought to action as um, colleague Graham Macklin has also written a, a piece about. So there's been violent attacks on the 5G mounts. There's been um, plotting to exploit, uh, exploit um, 
COVID facilities, there's the plotting, plotting to kidnap Gretchen Richmer, but most spectacularly, there was the violent storming of the Congress that was not only directly related to the pandemic, but certainly one factor in the those um, months escalating uh, violence, um, both um, uh, violent ideas online. Um, and as you know, all kind of acts of violence begin with dehumanizing discourses that pave the way for violent action. And that we can also see throughout history, uh, you know, in the periods leading up to genocide, ethnic cleansing, um, or different forms of political violence, you will see uh, dehumanizing uh, propaganda paving the way for that kind of violence. And um, one final question, Kathy asks, um, changes in recruitment patterns. Um, have you noticed a change in the use of social media and online space for recruitment? That seems kind of tailored to you too, uh, Catherine. Um, well, on the platforms I've looked at, so that's primarily 4chan, it's kind of an ongoing echo chamber. So it is already a red pilled community primarily. Uh, but you do see how during the pandemic, uh, we have more screen time uh, and particularly young people have lots and lots of more hours in front of the computer screens. So there's been research also now recently into how particularly gaming platforms uh, are being used by far right extremists to recruit youngsters. And it could be also mainstream platforms such as TikTok or Roblox, where you suddenly have an account by a tool muffin where you have a, a gamified um, kind of uh, figures that are spreading the propaganda in a gamified and accessible way to, to kind of groom and recruit uh, youngsters uh, as young as 12, 13 years old. So um, the digital lives um, means that increased screen time means that also there are more groups that are more vulnerable to also uh, um, online recruitment and propaganda. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think um, our time is up. Uh, Los Eric, thanks a lot. Yeah, Katrina, thank you. thanks a lot. Yes, I'm and, not. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you to all of uh, those out there who've been uh, watching. And we'll see you next time.